up on Tech News Today. It's the big debut. Everyone's all lined up for it. We'll tell you what it is, plus why the yellow spot means quality and why you're going to trust us because you follow us on Twitter. You're going to love this show. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, June 24th, 2010. Tech News Today is brought to you by Slingbox. Watch your favorite TV shows when you're away from home with Slingbox. To find an indoor, in-store demo at a Best Buy near you, visit slingbox.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Becky Worley. And I'm Dr. Kiki. Behind the board is our iPhone-less producer, Eric Lanigan. I'm- I want to get one of those indoor demos. That sounds great. Yes. I need those outdoor demos. <laughs> indoor, outdoor <laughs> demos for your sling box. Check them out at Best Buy. Uh, this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day along with you, try to make sense of it all. And, of course, uh, I know Dr. Kiki not as excited about this <laughs> as us, but the uh, the big debut today, Becky. Everyone's excited. Everyone was getting in line to see the new Microsoft store in San Diego, California. Yay! Yay! Look at that line. Everyone lined up for I was the, there. the new Microsoft store. And, uh, come on. Come on. Thanks to Jay Regadio for uh, providing us that video. They, there was an Apple store there, too. I guess a bunch of people were in line for something <laughs> yeah, over there something, as well. Something else, right? Uh, yeah. I'm excited. I'm going to San Diego this weekend. Oh, you're going to go to the Microsoft store? The UK store? to yeah. San Diego, right past the Microsoft store. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, everybody was buying the iPhone 4 today. Uh, and uh, analysts, according to Wired, uh, analyst predicts that they will sell 1 million iPhones today, becoming the setting the record for the first company to sell a million smartphones in a day. It was unbelievable. This was the story of the day. People were waiting in line for hours on the East Coast. In New York City, it was 100 degrees outside. People were paying hundreds of dollars to have people wait for them. Uh, A couple of interesting things I called around here in California at the Walnut Creek store, which I thought might be more representative sort of the Apple store is not in huge, big cities. They had lines of three to four hours. Um, They don't expect to have an iPhone for everyone. And uh, another interesting tidbit, uh, an Apple store employee told uh, Scoble that they will only hold pre-ordered phones till tonight. Now, yeah. I don't know that if That was true with the iPad as well. If you had reserved your, your device, you, they held it for the first day, but you had to show up on that day and, and, and pick it up. I, I stood in line. I had reserved mine at the Emeryville store here in California uh, and got in line when they opened the store at 7 and started letting people in, I was 99th in line, and I was in line for about 40 minutes. That's not bad. Uh, and then once I got in, they were very efficient. It only took 5, 10 minutes to, to buy the phone, get it activated. And you bought a second phone as well. I did, didn't yeah, you? but I didn't, I didn't activate that one. No. I bought that one for Leo. He's, he's paying me back, I think. I think. <laughs> I hope. So what do you think, Tom? You like it? Yeah, I like it fine. Uh, you know what? It's uh, it's a very pretty screen, like everybody's been saying, this whole retinal display thing. It really does improve quite a bit on the previous screen. Uh, and the, the FaceTime thing is nifty. Uh, yeah. But most of yep. the other uh, advancements in the phone itself uh, came with iOS 4, so I already had them. Um, my 3G, it's not like when I went from the 3G to the 3GS as far as performance, where I suddenly went, oh my gosh, this thing isn't slow anymore. It's great. Right. Uh, I'm not seeing that kind of difference. I, I'm not underwhelmed, but I'm just whelmed. Just whelmed. You're whelmed. Yeah. Now, the question the- is, are you concerned about the reception? Because there have yes. been a lot of stories online about holding the phone and having the reception bars go down. Um, what have you noticed so far, if anything, about reception and about this bar and holding it in one hand or the other issue. When you were uh, calling me earlier, uh, I was here in the in the studio while we were doing our live coverage this morning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was holding it left-handed through that entire call. Wow. Uh, not, wow. Not, not, a, not an issue. And I, I am holding it left-handed now. I got full bars. But what I found is if I squeeze it really hard, I can make those bars go down. So I, I think maybe people just hold it really tight. Don't uh, drop something. it. They're yeah. afraid of dropping yeah, it and exactly. cracking the screen. Uh, but the way I hold it 
uh, doesn't seem to affect the uh, the reception at all. So, so one of the so the reports that are out are that the iPhone four because you hold it and it interferes with the way that the external antenna goes around it, that that causes a drop in reception or that the bars decrease. Um, And this is a big story. I'm going to be doing it on GMA tomorrow. And there's controversy around it because some people say that if you hold any phone, reception is decreased because it causes interference or in some cases I've heard it's increased. Um, Then there's also Walt Mossberg wrote up in the Wall Street Journal in his review that he noticed that um, there were fewer bars on the phone but he still had reception and that when he compared the old iPhone to the new iPhone, it was just the bars that had gone down. Now, uh, um, Boy, Gen- Boy Genius Report also yeah. reporting with a video that this happens to the uh, iPhone 3G when it has iOS 4. So they're yeah. speculating or alleging that that's actually a software issue, not an antenna issue. Right. I, I replicated the exact same thing four different times in four different places at my house with the iPhone 3GS running the new software. Um, and I am really curious, because i got to do this story tomorrow, if there are any super nerdy engineers or anybody who has thoughts on this, um, send me some info. I'm at B. Worley on Twitter. Um, if you think that all phones have uh, changed or diminished um, reception just by putting your hand on it. So I would really like to hear what the, uh, the TWIT or the TNT army thinks about this possible defense for lack of reception on the new iPhone. The other uh, issue is there are always issues with any new product releases, the yellow spot issue. <laughs> Apparently, Brian Brushwood uh, had this. Uh, Brian Brushwood of NSFW and Scam School had a yellow spot. Now, in gadget reporting, that uh, Apple Insider forum posters seem to imply that it's because of a bonding agent called Organofunctional Selene Z6011 that bonds the it. layers of glass. <laughs> and apparently, because some of these were shipped so quickly, the evaporation process isn't complete. And so it should go away after one or two days. It's the heat that's making it look yellow. Once the evaporation process completes, the blotches would disappear, which would explain why it's not on every single iPhone because some of them them have been around longer than Mm -hmm. others. Dr. Kiki, do you think some ointment could help? <laughs> you just put it on, it'll stop itching. And just Okay. <laughs> just splotches, splotches, spots. So there you go, folks. There's so the, the, the there's the marker in our tech news today. Note the time code. Pass it to your friends who don't want to hear anything more about iPhone 4. We are moving on to other news. Uh, if you're just hoping never to hear about Apple again, you're going to be disappointed. Because Edward J. Markey and Joe Barton... Uh, have announced they've sent a letter to Steve Jobs expressing their concerns and asking for information regarding reports that Apple is gathering location information from its customers. So this is the new terms of service. Wait, wait, wait. They send this as a letter to Steve Jobs? Yes. So I think the answers to all these uh, questions would be, yep, yep, nope, (laughs) nope, yep, (laughs) maybe. Not none of your business. They asked some very pointed questions, though. I mean, questions, and they want answers by July 12th. So let me read some of these to you. Uh, what internal procedures are in place to ensure that any location data is stored anonymously in a form that does not personally identify lots cust- of them. Uh, consumers? Mm-hmm. We got That's lots a of, big one. Lots of procedures. Um, who are the unspecified partners and licensees with whom Apple is sharing this data? App makers. Um, and then this one. How does this comply with the requirements of Section 222 of the Communications Act, which mandates that no consumer location information be shared without the explicit prior consent of the consumer? And then they go on to say that if this is the only way you can use it, what's up with that? Well, and you know what this is going to get to the bottom of? Because uh, when you go into the settings, uh, you're able to uh, turn off geolocation for any individual app, but you can't turn it off for Apple. You, there's right. just nothing that just says Apple company collecting it. Mm-hmm. So we don't know whether they're collecting it or not. And uh, and if, they, if they're if they forthcoming and, and of good faith in answering these questions, we should find out if there is any other collection happening besides just that that is needed for individual applications. What purpose would it serve Apple to collect all of that information? Uh, I have- I ads. I ads. Being able to deliver you ads. Yep. So, th- but there's not a little I ads thing that says turn it off for that. Right. 
Which you should be able to, to opt in or out of. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, sadly, uh, that privacy story also turned into an iPhone story. But not an <laughs> iPhone 4 story. It's an <laughs> iOS 4 story. Just iPhone. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's thank our sponsor first before we get on to the rest of the non-Apple news today. This podcast is brought to you by Slingbox. Slingbox lets you watch your home TV on any portable device. iPhone 4 works I was trying it out earlier. You can use the Slingbox app on the iPad. And uh, Dr. Kiki can use the Slingbox app on Android now because it just came out. Leo was saying yes. it's the best one of the bunch. Excellent it because, you know, that's Android. <laughs> <laughs> so check it out. Go to Best Buy. Uh, buy a Slingbox. Bring it home. Plug it into your TV. Plug it into the Internet. Uh, turn it on and you get all of your television programs over your phone, over your laptop, wherever you are in the world. There's no blackouts, no restrictions, no service fee. Uh, this morning I was sitting here on my new phone watching some baseball, watching the, uh, watching the Padres and the Rays play nice. uh, while we were doing the live coverage from home. Didn't have to pay extra for that. That's my service that I already pay for coming from home over the internet just to me. So check it out. Uh, go to a Best Buy near you or to find an in-store demo at a Best Buy near you, just visit slingbox.com. And guys, I think we should agree we're not going to have any soccer spoilers on the show, right? No scores coming out? No, not after yesterday. Okay, it's a pact. It's yeah. a pact. <laughs> and, um, Apologies for that. And Eric, I think the Slingbox people are going to be so appreciative of you taking that cutaway of me while Tom was doing his ad <laughs> while I was eating. Thank you so much. Well, it just goes to Slingbox, show, you. if you like to, you know, eat your sandwich while you're watching your favorite TV programs, you can do it from anywhere. Or if you like to eat your rice balls. I'm eating my bag of rice, people. I'm kind of desperate here, okay? Did you Perhaps make the bag of rice yourself, or did you have to buy a bag of rice? No, this is old takeout rice. Buy. I'm desperate here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Can I have a bag of rice, please? <laughs> so Twitter has settled charges with the Federal Trade Commission for failing to safeguard your personal data. There were two instances. Uh, there was the one between January and May of 2009 where hackers were able to uh, access and get administrative access to Twitter's system simply by using password guessing software. Yep. Then there was the separate instance where they broke into a Twitter employee's Gmail account and found passwords in plain text that they were able to use to guess the employee's admin password to the Twitter system. So the FTC has slapped Twitter on the wrist saying uh, that pe Twitter is not allowed uh, to use easy to guess passwords <laughs> anymore. Uh, um, they, they also have to disable admin passwords after a reasonable number of bad login attempts. Uh, and they have to not promise uh, that they won't have serious lapses in the company's data security unless they mean it. They must have their information <laughs> security independently evaluated every three years uh, for the next 20 years or face a $16,000 penalty per incident. Do you think every okay. three years is, I mean, that seems like a huge period of time. Also $16,000. $16,000 is not for much. For a big company. For, yeah. Exactly. Which Twitter is per becoming. Incidents, per incident could be yeah, that uh, could mount multiplied That's by true. a pretty massive user base. If you yep. count like thousands of Twitter accounts getting uh, hacked, then yeah, all right. I guess, that, well, I guess that's a good can point. add up. Yeah. Well, wasn't this the, uh, the uh, one where Barack Obama sent out an email asking if you wanted a $500 gas card? Wasn't that the result yes. of one of these hacks? Yes. <laughs> That's somebody with a few followers. I'm just saying. I now, like that the, <laughs> the company can't mislead consumers about its security and privacy policies for 20 years. Oh, yeah. So 21, 21 years? Go nuts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. But I have a couple questions about this. So when, when you read that, um, and when I read this story, they said that they have to uh, mandate stronger passwords and mandate password changes. This is internally at for Twitter employees, right? Right. So I think this is interesting that the FTC is mandating best practices for private companies' security. Yeah. It's, it's, and that that sets an interesting precedent for other companies that feel that they may need to comply with that if that's a new standard. Twitter is being very cooperative here. Basically, they said, hey, we had already put in place all of these things, so we have no problem complying with this. Where other companies may have fought them and said, yeah, those are all good ideas and we've already done them, but you have no business right. telling us what we can right. and can't do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it is it is precedent setting and i can't i can't say that this has never happened before but i have not heard of something like this happening before. yeah but do you think it i mean is it twitter's job to fight against that kind of regulation so that that this sort of precedent does not get put in place i mean in, in a sort of free market sense yes they yeah. should be saying you know what 
if we want to have bad security, we should be allowed to. And right. people should just not use us anymore. And that would be the market punishment. But the government yeah. shouldn't come riding in and tell us we can't. That we we that have to. This is what we have to do. Yeah, and, that we have yeah. to be good citizens. I mean, and it and it is good security practices. Yes, change your passwords every once in a while. Make them hard to guess. That that's what you learn to the do. The password cannot be Twitter. That's the one. <laughs> that's the one password they said specifically. Or password. Or would password. Be the password that they might want to uh, stipulate. Andy Rubin, uh, Google's VP of Engineering, announced today that Android phones are being activated at a rate of one hundred sixty thousand per day. Uh, that's that's a pretty accelerated growth, is it not? Two activations a second. And this is up from in February, um, 60,000 a day, now 160,000 a day. And if you look at the market share numbers on smartphones, I mean, today is a good example. A million iPhones sold today is the estimate. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we are seeing huge growth in this category, Tom. Oh, yeah. I mean, smartphones are computers now. Yes, when, yeah. when, when I look at, a, at the uh, the top five most wanted a smartphone or t products it's all smartphones right mm -hmm. there's right. Uh, there my, i think the ipads up there sometimes personal media devices but yeah what people want it rarely is a tv every once in a while it's a netbook might be a game console if the game console is brand new and hot but the rest of the time it's smartphones smartphones so Nielsen put out numbers on smartphone market share in, uh, they were reflective of Q1, so the first three months in September, uh, in uh, 2010. And RIM, 35%, Apple, 26%, Windows Mobile, 19 Android, 9 I think that these numbers are going to get shaken up to the nth degree because the market is so in flux right now and there's so much change. I think we're going to see a monster change when we get numbers from this summer. We will keep an eye on that and keep you updated. Uh, meanwhile, something else we're keeping an eye on is the .XXX domain name. I bet you are. According to years. the International Business Times, uh, ICANN is expected to give the go-ahead to .XXX starting tomorrow. Mm. This is the one that was go. blocked by the Bush administration yep. at one point, but ICANN has a lot more independence from the U.S. government than it did back then. Uh, so they they will now, uh, according to this, allow that dot triple X. Now I don't know if there is going to be a restriction on who can use it. That, there was talk right. in the past that you would have to be a porn site or something. That it would some be sort of the red light X district yeah. for the internet, um, or the other way around. There was wasn't there talk at one point in time is would this mandate that all porn all sites have, have to be would have to change? And I don't mm -hmm. think that is true at all. Um, I think that's a real tragedy. Because as, you know, in my place, the way that I feel about that is it would make it so much easier for me to find my porn. That's I'm great. just saying. <laughs> well, we'll find out. It. We will I'm find out if the, if the formal announcement comes tomorrow as expected. We'll find out uh, what, if any, strictures there are on it. But, but as far as these indications uh, say, it will just be like any other domain that you can choose to have it based on what it says about you. Right, and that makes sense. It helps you identify. Yes, you can if you want to self-identify as dot triple X. <laughs> you know, maybe you just make moonshine, and, and you're, or, or you're know. Vin Diesel. Right, <laughs> <laughs> that's possible. A small but important market, or you like kisses. <laughs> or you like kisses. Yes, this uh, will also be something that um, the market decides. If dot mm -hmm. triple X domains um, find that you know that oh people are going to them more, then everybody will shift over. But you're never gonna you know you're never gonna convert the, all the masses. Yeah. Zogby International just published an interesting study uh, that people trust Google, Apple, and Microsoft more than Facebook and Twitter, and a lot more than traditional media. That's a sad, sad state of affairs. More than uh, 2,100 people surveyed uh, said that they trusted Apple, Google, and Microsoft completely or a lot, 50%. 50 percent. 50 percent of the people surveyed, or, or more. Or more. Uh, mm -hmm. That was compared to 8 percent trusting Twitter, 13 percent trusting Facebook, and less than 8% trusting traditional media. Yeah, I mean, it? it's really interesting, though, because the numbers for teens trusting Facebook and Twitter were almost double that of adults. So, um, you know, there's definitely an, an age gap, a generational discrepancy. And I'm just wondering here about the difference between the uh, the trustworthiness of the brand versus the trustworthiness of the information that comes from the brand. So, and what is the relative importance of that information? So, Google 
your Microsoft, maybe you're, you're searching for information there. They're, they're serving up websites and, and, and things for you. But then Twitter, Facebook, it's information maybe coming from who knows who, people you randomly follow or friends even. Right. So I you, think that's you, a good point because the other thing about that is that when you're comparing this to traditional media, people often um, assign um, values around conservative or liberal values, yep. political values to traditional media outlets, and they don't assign those to companies like Google and Microsoft and Yahoo. Yep. And, and I think the perception is that a media organization is going to try to hide those values because they're purporting to be objective, whether mm -hmm. you believe right. they really are or not. Whereas on Facebook and Twitter, you assume that they're biased because yep. they're regular people, but you don't necessarily think they're trying to hide it. Whereas a company actually gets a pass. It's like, they're just in business. That's just business. They're not going to take a side because that's bad for business. I would love to hear how this, uh, how this uh, survey would turn out, um, not surveying people in the United States. So internationally, like surveying people from different countries and breaking it up based on, on their uh, social structures. But that it really, would be interesting. It really puts the lie to the idea of the journalists are the one keeping an eye on those untrustworthy big companies. Well, and trust, you don't trust is them. such an important <laughs> uh, an important term in journalism, you know. Yeah. And think about it, if you're listening to this podcast, you started by hearing what we think of as our motto is podcasts you love from people you, you trust. trust. Yep. And you have to have people you trust giving you the news. So I think it's a really depressing statement for big media if the numbers are down to 8% of adults trusting big media. I think it's mostly because uh, when you read a newspaper or watch a television program, it does nothing to your level of oxytocin. <gasps> I think very, you're right. Po very possible. Uh, yes. Whereas when you use Twitter or Facebook, it apparently spikes the level of oxytocin. And what is oxytocin exactly? Oxytocin is the bonding hormone, most commonly known for its release at, uh, at, at birth. Mothers release oxytocin, and uh, it's for breastfeeding, getting the mother and child to bond. But it has to do with relationships and trust, and it makes you feel happy. Your, your blood pressure goes down, you relax. Adam Pennenberg at Fast Company uh, did an experiment on himself, well, he, with, with help from a, a lab. And Twitter. Uh, <laughs> where he, he had his blood taken, spent a little while social networking, couple hours, had his blood taken again, and in those couple hours, his oxytocin level went up 13%. I mean, and he looks it, really happy. I mean, look at that. He does look happy. <laughs> that is, after so, is that an after social networking picture? <laughs> but I mean, that's the whole point of these, these services, right? It's bonding. It's it friendship. Is. And even if it's sort of simulated or um, it, it remote bonding, it is something that makes you feel connected to other people. Although, what do you think about in the long term? I would say people who exclusively social, use social media sites, they kind of in the big picture feel removed from other people. Agreed? I don't know that that's necessarily true. I mean, I guess it's the exclusivity of it. If they're yeah. isolating themselves in real life and only connecting online, then then possibly. But in terms of the majority of people who use social media, it is a tool and it, it's um, in addition to the extroverted things that they do in connecting in the real life. And, and the point that I, I'd love to bring up is that uh, your brain doesn't really know the difference between being online in the virtual world or being in the real world. If you're connecting, if you're having an experience, it is a real experience. And uh, your brain is just a filter for information and it doesn't necessarily know the difference. So if you are bonding, you're bonding, you know. And you get the beneficial effects either way. Either uh, way. You were talking about the fact that, it, you know, when you have oxytocin in your system, it lowers your blood pressure. Yes. Uh, it, and, and one Australian experiment discovered that people with a sizable network of friends were less likely to pass away over a 10-year period than those with a small circle of friends. Uh, and that the distance separating the friends made no difference. It was just having the friends. Just having. So if you're Mark Zuckerberg, you're never going to die. <laughs> This man is going to be a murderer. live forever. That's I want to what's see... behind Facebook. It's an immortality play. I want to see that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Zombie Zuckerberg. Zombie Zuckerberg. That'd be great. <laughs> Unless he goes to Pakistan, because remember that story? They want to put him in prison well, for life. Right. Or worse. So, I mean, yeah, he's, exactly. he's on all sides of the, of the coin here with his life expectancy. <laughs> I don't think there's enough oxytocin <laughs> to balance out that stress. No. Yeah, maybe not. Watch out for that cortisol, corticosterone.
Mike, I'm sorry, Mark Soups, uh, or Supes, I'm not sure, it's S-U-P-P-E-S, is a web developer for Gucci, uh, but in his spare time, he's making a personal fusion reactor. Gee. In a New York City warehouse. That's he's nice going nuclear? Yeah. Nuclear? <laughs> he raised $4,000 over the web. I'm not sure if it was Kickstarter or not, but it was something like that. Uh, and he's putting $35,000 of his own money in, and he says he's doing it. That he, he is going to get more energy out than he puts in. He's confident. And I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that his confidence might be misplaced. He's prob- he definitely will be able, can build a fusion reactor. People do it. Physicists do it all, all the time. And there are small fusion reactors and larger fusion reactors. And, and they are complicated. But really, in the, sk- in the scheme of things, not too complicated to put together. Um, but in terms of energy in versus energy out, no one has created a fusion reactor that gets more energy out of it then is put in. Now, it we're has getting, not happened yet. That's what we're working on. We're trying to get there. We're getting a lot of radioactive jokes. Uh, yeah. And we should we should point out that a fusion reactor doesn't use plutonium or uranium. Oh, no, not this at is, all. This is not a fission reactor. It's exactly. a fusion reactor. Fusion. And there, there are different designs for the fusion reactor. It's basically, in the end, what it does is it smashes atoms together. And in, in pushing them together, energy is, is created. Exothermic reactions. What I didn't uh, realize until I read this story is that there is a growing community of fusioneers. Yeah. These are amateur science junkies who build homemade fusion reactors. And Mr. Soups is the 38th independent amateur physicist. Uh, and when BBC talked to Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories and Stark, uh, she said, as long as private citizens obtain the material legally, mm-hmm. uh, the components of the reactor, they can do whatever they want. There's, yeah. there's no problem with this. No, there is no problem with this. This is not because it's not radioactive. It's not it's not something that can help terrorists or be taken to any, you know, any extremes in any way. But when you say uh, when you say nuclear, nuclear, people just get a little wiggy. No, 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 it's nuclear. Like lots of things have nuclei. It's nuclear. <laughs> you, you are also nuclear. Yeah, you are. You're you've Good got point. neutrons in your in your cells right now. You're radioactive. You're radioactive. How much radioactivity do you think I'm giving off right now? I don't know. I should but know that. I should, little, just, I should a, just have that statistic. There's trace amounts all the time. That's a good party <laughs> statistic. Did you know Did that you Martini know? is giving her <laughs> 0.5 rads right now? All right. Uh, what is also radioactive is our voicemail. Not, <laughs> not at all. Uh, but better to have a horrible transition than none at all. Right, Becky? Oh right, Tom. Oh. Uh, we have we have one voicemail we want to play today, uh, uh, and it's from Jeff, and he he just wanted to let us know something important. I was just uh, this is Jeff, the social media journalist from Boston. I'm just calling to make sure the number for the show works, and it does. And now I have it in speed dial, and I will call you later with a question. Maybe not later today, but later. Thanks. Keep up the good work. Bye. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. That was awesome. Good. <laughs> We'll uh we'll be here. Call us when you get when you get the question. But it all it all Just, and we wanted to let him know that we got the message and it does play back and we heard it. So and we've right. taken your phone number and put it on seed <laughs> dial and and we've written it on several bathroom stalls throughout the county. <laughs> I hope it was okay to post it to the forums, but. Ah, uh, we kid, awesome. Jeff. No, that was great. I, I just that just made me chuckle when, when we got awesome. that. So uh, now he's going to be like, "You bastard! Hey, I'm, I'm never, never calling call you." Two six zero TNT show though. If you need to test it out to find out if it works, on to the emails to TNT at twit.tv. Got the first one for us, Becky. Hey guys, I was all excited about Becky's mention of the sale of EA games. This is from Norm Fazekas from Austin, Texas. But he goes on. I was confused by their pricing on iTunes. If you look at the iPhone game site, you'll see on EA uh, Mobile, you'll see the games like Battleship, Connect 4, and Tiger Woods being available for 99 cents. But if you click on any of these, you're taken to another EA page indicating a price of not 99 cents and to iTunes, also not 99 cents. He says he sent a note to EA through their convoluted support site. But they said he wouldn't get a reply within 24 hours, by which time the 48-hour sale would be over. He says, I know this isn't your issue, but I thought you should know it's a bit fragged up. Uh, Keep up the good work. And I got to tell you, Norm, I'm flaming ticked right now 
at Play this event. So I was so excited to bring a good deal to the uh, mobile gamers, and so I'm really bummed it doesn't work. Did you, um, Tom, you said you, you checked it? I checked it out, and uh, on the EA site, it'll still say, uh, for instance, Connect 4 was one that I checked. 99 cents, you click through, it takes you to the iTunes store, and the iTunes store, it's 2 99 now, I'm um, so flame and tick. There was one that was 99 cents in the iTunes store. I'm trying to remember which one it was. I think it was one that I already owned, like SimCity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I feel like it was just sort of a bad communication uh, timing issue. I can't say that they were never 99 cents, but it sounds like they just didn't sh update their site and the <laughs> iTunes pricing at the same time. Yeah, and, and Way you know to that, the promotion. And you know that... Did you try? Did you try to click all the way through and purchase? Yes, so that I did. When I you did, get there's no I discount right taken the, or anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah I went right okay. to the. I did all but buy it. Right. Uh, so I don't know if I, if I'd actually clicked install or you know and got the confirmation screen, but usually the price doesn't change at that point. So what it does, I'm sure it just gives you a coupon for you know the X amount of dollars off your next game purchase. You think? <laughs> no, no. Probably not. They, that guy <laughs> shows up at your. Here's it. your coupon. Here's your coupon. Uh, we do have Sunken Planet in the chat room saying it worked for him. He got a few at 99 cents. So that cor corroborates my idea that this was probably correct at the beginning of the promotion and they just didn't time the ending of it correctly. On to Matt from Lexington who writes uh, in HTML tags, tongue in cheek, downloaded my daily TNT podcast today, episode 17, and was listening to it at my cube when I was pleasantly surprised to hear that an email comment I'd sent on was deemed worthy enough to share with your listeners. That or it's a slow email week. As Becky's dulcet voice carried my words across the airwaves and I waited with growing anticipation to hear her and Tom's wise and ever-relevant commentary on it, lo and behold, a squirrel apparently ran through the studio, instantly jerking Tom's attention away. Squirrel! <laughs> apparently said squirrel was disguised as an iPhone and had been captured and released by one Will Soap. So I'd just like to say that I hope Mr. Soper and his crisp, clear, glass-on-the-back, retina display, very legible, camera-swiveling, 5-megapixel, deep black squirrel are very happy together. <laughs> and please give them my regards and a peanut. Slash tag and tongue-in-cheek, Matt from Lexington. <laughs> that was uh, a great rant. He is, of course, referring to the fact that Becky was reading uh, his email when uh, Leo got a hold of an iPhone 4 and came in and we all started, you know, salivating over it and looking at it because it yep. was the first one we'd had in hand here in the cottage. Uh, and to give Matt his due, he was saying we had talked about the Connect as being sort of the minority report interface, and he thought that that was actually just too much work for a lot of people. Yeah, and, so, and so we never got a chance to comment on the fact that, yes, you know, thinking about, like, how long could you do the, you know, everything's in front of you thing that Tom Cruise does before you get the gorilla arms? Oh! So, Matt, you were <laughs> right we're so glad you emailed us. And I just want to tell you that I'm going to personally, oh my God, what just ran across my floor? <laughs> it's a it's a Droid X. <laughs> Poor Matt. Thank you, Matt, uh, for being a good sport and for sending that along and giving us the opportunity to actually discuss <laughs> your email finally. Uh, we appreciate that. And uh, folks, if, if you would like to uh, risk what Matt has risked, you can email us. Uh, TNT at twit.tv. You can give us a call, 260-260-TNT-SHOW. Uh, don't forget to watch Dr. Kiki's other fine programs on the Twit Network. Uh, we're on on Thursdays right after Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Yes, and uh, coming soon in July, Green Tech will be Green Tech Today with Sarah Lane. That's going to be a lot of fun, so get ready for that. And, of course, and This Week in Science. My favorite, This Week in Science. Yes. you got to check that out. Uh, well, that's live now on Tuesday evenings. Monday, Monday evenings, evenings currently, so. but we may be changing the time soon. All right. Well, just subscribe. Subscribe. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you later. See you uh, Tuesday, Becky. Bye.